So, as you know, uh, the glycome of every cell uh, is composed of different uh, types of glycoconjugates, which involves uh, glycoproteins, um, uh, protoglycans, glycosaminoglycans, um, uh, uh, glycosphingolipids, and so on. So the mo multiplicity of uh, glycoconjugates are huge in a given cell. And in fact, this glycosylation in normal conditions in the cell is highly controlled. So, for example, just as, as an example, in N glycosylation, the biosynthesis of the precursor structure that is being to, to uh, be uh, added to the aspergin in a protein that is being synthesized is highly controlled in normal conditions. And of course, when the cell, uh, when the protein has this uh, glyco N glycoside, uh, the specific uh, uh, complex of enzymes will uh, transfer this N block. This is initial N glycan. And of course, the protein can have other sites of N glycosylation and could have other sites, other N glycosylation added to the same protein. And then the, the protein moves to the own, uh, it goes to the quality control, as you know very well. It goes to the quality control uh, of uh, uh, conformation. Uh, this will go, the protein will go on in the secretory pathway, and in the secretory pathway, in the Golgi apparatus, will undergo major alterations depending on the set of glycosyl transferases present expressed in that given cell. So a protein that is produced in a given cell will depend on the machinery of glycosyl transferases present in that, expressed in that cell. So this is highly controlled in normal conditions. This is the case of N glycosylation. I just should mention the other major type of protein O glycosylation, which uh, I'm talking about the Galnac O glycosylation, the most abundant modification, O glycan modification. So this is a protein that will start glycosylation by a family of a polypeptide Galnac transferases. And the human genome will have 20 uh, genes codifying enzymes that will add this initial step, the addition of N-acetylgalactosamine to the serine or turning in a given protein. Of course, these polypeptide Galnac transferases have a, a cell uh, specificity of expression. So the O glycoproteome will also be uh, different depending on the set of polypeptide Galnac transferases adding this first step. Then the protein, the oglacosylation, will suffer extension, ramification, and so on, and termination with fucosylation and acetylation, and so on. Of course, this could be, uh, this, uh, f in normal conditions, the, given the, the cell that you are, that you have, you may have, for example, type 1 structures expressed, like Lewis A and Lewis B. And, but you may also, in another cell, for example, uh, in a metallurgical uh, cell, you may have a type 2 uh, formation of glycans. So this is highly controlled in normal setting. Well, apart from the a family of, polype of um, glycosyl transferases expressed in the, in, the, in the cell, and actually there are more than 200 genes expressed in a given cell, you have all other factors affecting this glycosylation. You may have, and of course, as I mentioned before, these 200 genes in the human genome that are capable of doing different activities, of glycosyl transferase activities, they have cell and tissue expression specificity. But the other factors that I would like to mention is the molecular chaperones, the donor substrates, and actually the donor substrates are quite influenced by several factors. 
the acceptor substrates, so if you have alterations in the acceptor sub substrates in the, in the secretory pathway, you may have changes also uh, in the final product uh, that you're going to produce. And I should also mention glycosidases. Glycosidases, endogenous ones, but also exogenous ones like those present in the intestinal uh, setting due to the microbiome uh, of, the, of, that, of a given individual. So this all is uh, controlling the normal glycosylation uh, setting. So this glycosylation, for example, in the normal uh, tissues, and this is just an example, in the normal mucosa, normal gastric mucosa, um, you have a, the cells follow, the tissue follows a clear differentiation program. And for example, in the superficial mucosa, you express type 1 uh, antigens, like H type 1, Lewis A, Lewis B. And in the deep glands, the differentiation program of this normal mucosa goes differently. It goes to express uh, type 2 uh, terminal structures like um, Lewis X and Lewis Y. So if you, use, if you analyze the glycome of a normal mucosa, you have the mixture of all these glycans. If you analyze the superficial mucosa, you have preferentially those structures. And if you analyze the deep glands, you have this. This is just a normal tissue. And uh, we know, for example, that in normal conditions, uh, H type 1 uh, structures like H, uh, type 1 structures like H type 1 and Lewis B are particularly relevant in this setting for the adhesion of a pathogen that uh, colonizes efficiently the human gastric mucosa. This is Helicobacter pylori, which recognizes this uh, fucosylated structure uh, present in the um, H type 1 and Lewis B structure, so the alpha 2 fucos to the galactose. So this is mediated by a a design identified by Thomas Borain in Sweden several years ago, uh, the BAB A uh, adhesin. In some cases, like the Helicobacter pylori, uh, and actually this Helicobacter BAB A uh, adhesion may also be influenced by polymorphisms, human polymorphisms that exist in the case of FUT2 enzyme. So the Fucosyl transferase FUT2. Some individuals will have this active enzyme, uh, and this will produce, as I mentioned, the H type 1 and Lewis B. So 80% of humans who have, in the Caucasian population, will have uh, this um, biosynthesis active. Some individuals, however, will present uh, inactive food to, uh, to polymorphisms. And this will mean that these individuals will not have this alpha-2 fucosylation. So that will be the ligand. They will produce the ligand for the Helicobacter pylori. So uh, there are nowadays, there are models like um, animal models, genetically uh, modified mice models. That this is the case of um, the FUT2 new mice model that can manipulate this glycome. And you can actually clearly see like I'm going to show in the next slide, the, the, the phenotype and the relevance for the adhesion of Helicobacter pylori. So this is, the well, uh, again, the foot new mice model. So having the expression as the wild-type mouse of the mucin mac 5 ac or the, mice, the mouse, the murine uh, mucin mac 5 ac which is a mucin expressed in normal uh, mucosa, not only in mice, but also in humans. But uh, this in the foot nu to null mouse, you can see there is no expression of Lewis B as detected by a monoclonal antibody to Lewis B. So obviously, this again, this uh, you can monitor this by different by mass spectrometry uh, data and and other techniques that I don't have time to to show you today. But I just wanted to highlight that this model is quite useful for understanding the 
the addition of the bacteria, but also in the context of non-secretors and secretors individuals of other bacteria and even the microbiome. The issue of some pathogens like Helicobacter pylori is that this is more complex than depending on just one adhesin. For example, the, Lewis, the Helicobacter pylori has a second adhesin that recognizes uh, uh, sialic acid. Uh, so it was called the sialic acid binding adhesin, sub A. So this is an uh, adhesin that recognizes the, the cellulated Lewis antigens. These antigens are normally not highly expressed in the normal epithelial cells of the gastric mucosa, but is upon gastritis, it is highly expressed uh, upon uh, inflammation caused by the initial Helicobacter pylori gastritis. And several of the genes involved in this switch of glycosylation include glycosyl transferases, as expected, including uh, beta-3 glucnactive 5, beta-3 gal T5, food 3 that is induced, and also uh, that could be uh, inf influencing the biosynthesis of, of the terminal glycan structures, Lewis A, cellular Lewis A and cellular Lewis X. This was shown a long time ago. And actually, when we analyze the adhesion of Helicobacter pylori strains, depending on the adhesins they express, because they are also strains have uh, different virulent uh, genetic uh, features, uh, they uh, show particularly adhesion of ad uh, see the second adhesin, the, the, ad the binding of Helicobacter pylori, depending on uh, of the sub A is particularly relevant for the adhesion to uh, gastric mucosa that express um, this uh, cellulated uh, uh, Lewis antigens. So this initial step, so the, the model that uh, it is uh, proposed is that bacteria, the Helicobacter pylori uh, Bab A recognized the focosylated um, glycans expressed in the normal mucosa, of, uh, particularly on the secretor uh, individuals. Helicobacter will have, as we all know in the field, will have type 4 secretion system that will inject um, proteins in the host uh, epithelial cell. That will induce changes in the uh, signaling pathway. This will induce uh, translocation uh, uh, of uh, factors that will lead to, trans, uh, to uh, transcription of specific genes like IL-8 and TNF-alpha, and this will induce changes in other neighboring cells, inducing the transcription of beta 3 gnt 5 and other glycosyl transferase genes that will lead to the aberrant expression uh, of cellulated structures that will allow this chronic uh, inflammation and adhesion of this bacteria in the gastric mucosa. Well, but what happens in cancer? Well, in cancer, you have uh, many changes occurring, and nowadays we and many others have clearly shown changes in genetic changes, like mutations in molecular chaperones, uh, mutations in glycosyl transferase genes, uh, and of course, alterations in transcription, like upregulation and downregulation of genes, codifying different uh, glycosyl transferases from different families of, 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 of glycosyl transferases, like CLO transferases, focosyl transferases, and many others. And this will lead to the selection of specific features. And as Gordon was showing very nicely uh, today, we now we study uh, just at the genetic level, uh, but we need to add this layer of complexity in terms of understanding all the other factors. And of course, these uh, glycosylation features are being selected in the in the cancer setting, and some of them are clearly are quite. Uh, uh, abundantly demonstrated in the field, in the cancer field, 
like this expression of uh, certain ganglocytes, uh, some shorter truncated oak glycans, uh, branched structures on end glycans uh, with cellulation and fucosylation, um, and Lewis antigens expression. So these features, these molecular features are being uh, selected in the in the in the set, in the clinical set, in the biological setting. I should mention before uh, going a little bit on t the biology underlying this, I should mention that these, some of these are known for a very long time in the field and actually have been incorporated in the, as you know, in the, in the um, clinical setting. For example, some of the old uh, glyco uh, biomarkers used in the clinics, in the oncology clinics, include serological assays uh, that have been uh, used for a long time, for example, the CA199, which recognized Sialyl Lewis A, and has been useful in colorectal, gastric, pancreatic uh, cancer. The CA125, CA like we have heard already this morning, uh, that recognized um, a, uh, a mucin, uh, mucin 16, 16 Max 16, and it has been widely used for uh, sometimes some types of tumors, particularly in ovary cancer, but in other settings also have been used. And the carcinoembryonic antigen, like uh, which is a glycoprotein, the CCAM5 glycoprotein that is heavily glycosylated, have been used for colorectal cancer but other exist and have been incorporated. So if we have a good myomarker that can be translated in a, a I would say, in a easy way to the clinic, I think we can uh, fight for introducing this into the clinics in the general use, for the general use in the, the clinical setting. But glycans are relevant in, the, in biological terms and tumors, what we, what we are seeing is what has been selected biologically. So glycans are, and we and many others have provided clear evidence that glycans modify key glycoproteins like cadherins, integrins, many, many, uh, influences receptor tyrosine kinases, are important, protoglycans are also very important in that setting. I will hopefully will mention this in the end of my presentation. And also, of course, in recognition by other proteins. Other proteins, uh, glycan binding proteins present in the tumor context, but also, uh, for example, uh, proteins that are being, lectins that are rec recognizing glycans uh, in a distant uh, metastasis um, uh, setting. So all these uh, biological aspects are, of glycans are contributing for dif different uh, steps in this aspect. But we need to understand that, I think, in the cancer setting, we need to understand that uh, tumors are heterogeneous. And nowadays, which we know, for example, I'm just going to use one example, for example, for gastric cancer, Gastric cancer is, uh, we know already for a long time, uh, that if you, you can classify this tumor in at least four molecular subtypes. This is based on genomics, uh, on epigenet and gene genetics, epigenetic and other uh, features. And this, uh, this clearly, these four subtypes correspond to four biological different entities, although they are known as gastric cancer. And actually in the clinics nowadays, they, uh, the clinicians uh, target of, uh, are starting uh, already uh, understanding this, uh, this uh, molecular subclassification uh, for, the, for understanding the disease, for prognostic influencing, uh, dec decision, and also for decision on therapeutic strategies. So we have been developing a program in which we think that we can add a, an, extra, an extra two layers of complexity on this setting, on this classification, 
Of course, we know there are four entities uh, in the case of gastric cancer, uh, molecular subclassification, but we can add the glycoproteomic on one uh, side, and on the other side, we can also add the glycomic uh, information to these different uh, molecular subtypes. And of course, this uh, we know it's relevant for the in the immune context for the um, uh, particularly for the treatment that patients may have, and actually some of these uh, molecular subtypes can be treated in different ways, and depending on this, and as glycans are important the, on this um, patient certification, may also add a layer of critical information to decide the treatment of the patient. Uh, what is implemented for gastric cancer in the clinics nowadays is a treatment of uh, anti-ER2, RB2, is a transmembrane tyrosine kinase receptor that is being uh, treated in a subtype of patient, patients that express this receptor. We know that this uh, protein, this receptor tyrosine kinase, is, has several sites of end glycosylation and they're interested in that protein glycosylation or that protein started when uh, one student in the lab was uh, analyzing the RB2 and saw that it was particularly critical. Uh, of course, it had N glycosylation, uh, but it was particularly disappearing some of glycans as here measuring by a lectin SNA. So we decided in that time to uh, develop um, um, clean uh, crit uh, models to study this glycosylation. And so we knock out by CRISPR-Cas9 ST6-GAL1, the enzyme that's adding this acceleration, this terminal acceleration on the N-glycans. And uh, of course, the knockout completely lack, the three independent clones lack completely the expression of this, so it's really dependent on this, on this the expression of, uh, of uh, this glycan is dependent on this enzyme. And Enric Duarte, in collaboration with Manfred Hurer, uh, Enric Duarte uh, was immunoprecipitating uh, from these uh, different clones the, um, the RB2. And uh, this uh, immunoprecipitated RB2 was submitted to uh, different uh, pro uh, glycoproteomic analysis and glycomic analysis. So in one side, we will have the in the glycomic analysis, we have the detailed analysis of the glycans present on this protein. On the glycoproteomics, we have information on the site of the, the, uh, of the RB2 that this N glycan is, or which N glycans are present there. In the glycomic analysis, as expected, there was a complete reduction of abolishment of the alpha to 6 N glycans. And there was some increase in alpha to 3 and increase in uh, focosylation. And some species are represented here, highlighting exactly this, this point. In the, I just mentioned briefly, in the, uh, of course, the glycoproteomic ana analysis provided the specific glycoforms present in specific sites of that protein. And this is just an example of asper aspergine 530 of the protein, in which of course, the knockout, uh, uh, the cells expressing the knockout uh, for that gene uh, were, did not express this uh, alpha to 6 cellulation as expected. In, and in some sites, and particularly in that site that I'm showing here as an example. So it was possible to establish the whole glycoproteome of the protein itself highlighting that some of the sites that were particularly affected were this 629 and 530 uh, that uh, are uh, within domain 4 of RB2. So domain 4 is the domain that is recognized by the therapeutic and monoclonal antibody transtuzumab used in the clinics. And um, Sorry. So, as I mentioned, patients that have that are R2 positive are treated with trastuzumab. 
but of course they don't measure the glycosylation at all. So we hypothesize that this glycosylation could have an impact in the, in the biology of the receptor in the tumor cell, but also in the treatment. So in fact, the, we observed that this receptor, uh, the ST6-GAL1 knockout uh, uh, cells, induced an extended time of RB2 half-life uh, in the membrane of the cell, and also upon treatment, and actually the cells expressing, exp uh, treated with trastuzumab, uh, show a show to, to be uh, uh, different uh, sensitivity to the uh, therapeutic antibody. Uh, so clearly demonstrating that when compared with the control, the cells show differences in metabolic activity uh, in response to the treatment of trastuzumab. Moreover, uh, we observe uh, different um, uh, Interaction with the receptor of the of the treat of the monoclonal antibody or the therapeutic antibody, so indicating that uh, this um, glycosylation is affecting the recognition and the prolonged stabilization of RB2 uh, of, and and forming the com uh, interacting with the trastuzumab at the cell surface of the tumor cell. Moreover, when we analyze in, uh, in tissues, in, uh, in a cohort of gastric cancer tissues, uh, we observed that patients within the same uh, stage of the disease at diagnosis, they, uh, and based on detection of proximity between, uh, uh, trans uh, between RB2 and Alpha to, uh, and the alpha to six elevation pre uh, detected by SNA in the same in the in the tissue in situ. Uh, so detection of this using the proximity ligation assay uh, allow us to differentiate patients within the same stage. In this case, stage three uh, of as having better or worse prognosis. So just by detecting this signal, we can. Uh, stratificate patients that will have a better and poor prognosis within patients that express RB2. Okay, so we think that uh, this will, this, uh, in this particular setting, on the RB2 setting, this will be particularly relevant for uh, this information for, for the tumors that uh, express this, this marker. Of course, for other tumors, gastric cancer, uh, samples who have to have other, other strategies. And of course, when we move to other organs, for example, colorectal cancer or for pancreatic cancer, this may be quite different indeed. So we have to understand the different glycomes and glycoproteomes in the different settings. I don't know how am I in terms of time, but if I'm okay, uh, yes, I will just show you the last part, which is quite of new data for those that have attended the last meeting. So uh, I wanted to highlight an, another friend of the glyco community is glycosaminoglycans. And I'm afraid these are quite, also, quite important also uh, because they are major components that have been described. I mean, glycosaminoglycans have been described influencing proliferation and geogenesis influencing tumor invasion and, and also uh, uh, remodeling extracellular matrix and metastasis. So um, glycosaminoglycans, as you know, are these uh, beautiful uh, linear uh, po polymers of uh, glycans that consist of initial four saccharides that are consistently linked to the proteoglycan or to the protein. And then you have these, these saccharides um, uh, repetition uh, in the chain. There are different types. Uh, several of them have been uh, highly characterized. And I'm going to focus today uh, particularly on the heparin sulfate um, glycosaminoglycan. This is uh, a work performed in the group by uh, uh, Anna Magalhães and 
uh, some uh, uh, PhD students like Katerina Marcus. So they have been studying this biosynthesis and particularly focusing and underst understanding the steps on, ex on uh, XTL2 and 3 which are enzymes responsible for the extens extension uh, or controlling the extension, so in step two. So first you have this linear initial assembly, step one, then you have the addition of the gluconac, and then you have the elongation and the modification of this. So this can suffer all kinds of modification, including the sulfation, of course. So they have been studying the XTL2 and 3, as I mentioned, and here is a, a, a model in which a cell line has been manipulated to be knocked out either to XTL2 or XTL3. So XTL2 uh, uh, knockout actually show um, a increase in uh, detection of uh, epinone sulfate uh, detection uh, by a specific uh, highly a control and published monoclonal antibody. And this, whereas, for example, the same antibody in XTL3 is completely not reactive. So this, again, this is just a cytometry, flow cytometry, but you can also clearly see here in the immunofluorescence, or even if you do an extract uh, in the gel, you can see clearly the, the knockout uh, or the control uh, and the knockout showing absence of, uh, of um, reactivity. So they also show here again the quantification by HPLC. Um, the quantification at XTL2 show increase in detection uh, uh, and the XTL3 so showed completely absence detection of the, of the heparin sulfate uh, disaccharides. Uh, there are some differences in terms of sulfation that were confirmed here, again, by HPLC. There are also some slight differences on chondroitin sulfate here that were observed. I don't have time to go into detail. One thing that uh, it drew very much the attention in this setting was the increased expression of syndicam 4. So syndicam 4... Uh, it's a protoglycan, as you know, and it's particularly relevant uh, in this setting because it was, uh, we and others have shown, we, actually we show a few years ago that this was expressed particularly in gastric cancer, in the gastric cancer setting. And again, uh, if, when we study in detail in the two major subtypes, histomorphologic subtypes of gastric cancer, uh, Syndicam 4 expression was particularly relevant in the intestinal subtype, whereas in the other major histological subtype, diffuse type, it was completely not detectable. So highlighting again how the glycome is important to understand the disease setting, because if you study intestinal subtype, this will have one particular relevant uh, setting, but if you study the, the whole thing, you may lose uh, information. So you have to stratify according to what biologists and what we know in the clinical setting. And he, actually, if we looked at, the, for example, when we analyzed uh, the, in this small cohort of 153 primary tumors, we uh, clearly see, again, in the intestinal subtype that the tumors were uh, differently expressing uh, Sinecam 4 in the primary tumor, but also in the lymph node metastasis of those tumors. When we look at the survival of the patient, stratifying based on high expression and low expression of Sinecam 4, we again see differences uh, in the, only in the intestinal subtype, not in the diffuse subtype. So we look into detail again and uh, first, we analyzed the CGA uh, database, and again, we observed clearly that the survival uh, of the disease uh, was particularly, uh, we can classify the different uh, prognosis of these patients based on the expression of this uh, high expression or low expression 
of Cinecom 4. And, uh, and when we did the overall, it's not so clear because in the overall survival of the patients, of course, we have um, different, um, different subtypes of tumors. So knowing that heparin sulfate protoglycans are very important in uh, different aspects, but including in the extracellular vesicles biogenesis, uh, particularly known to determine which uh, protein cargo could be contained in those uh, vesicles that all cells produce, but particularly relevant in the cancer setting because these extracellular vesicles may um, transport information to neighboring cells or to uh, inflammatory cells or to immune cells in the cancer context or even to metastatic niche uh, sites. We decided to look into detail on this of the role of this uh, heparin sulfate protoglycans in extracellular vesicles. And so we uh, did a purification uh, of this following a established protocol uh, using ultracentrifugation and size exclusion chromatography using, uh, again, the heparin sulfate, uh, the Syndicam 4 uh, knockout uh, models uh, to uh, uh, isolate extracellular vesicles. Here we show the isolation, clearly uh, nice isolation of the extracellular vesicles of, uh, of EVs, as highlighted here by markers CD9, CD81. We don't have the cytochrome C as expected, otherwise we will have contamination from um, mitochondria from the, from the, from the cells of and then we also see that the extracellular vesicles from Syndicam 4 knockout lack heparin sulfate and Syndicam 4 as expected here. We also show, uh, of course, we have the, micro, the electron microscopy uh, demonstrated isolation of the particles and also show by mass spectrometry the presence of the Syndicam 4 protein in those extracellular vesicles. Extracellular vesicles produced by Syndicam 4 knockout show to be a little bit, I mean, uh, smaller, uh, but, all, but more production. There were more pro uh, quantities, more amounts of these EVs compared with the control uh, uh, wild type uh, cell, but the EVs were smaller. But when we look in the functional assays of this key communication uh, particles, we uh, could see increased uh, differences in terms of uptake of recipient cells. Here we have different types of cells, for example, a neighboring gastric cancer cells that we could measure the uptake of labeled extracellular vesicles from wild type and from knockout. So the uptake is completely different, as you can see here, depending on the expression of the syndicum 4. Moreover, in Kupfer cells, uh, cells that are like macrophages in the liver of the, of, uh, of the liver, uh, they also show uh, uh, quite, uh, if quite a, a reduction uh, when in the uptake. You, you, we did all kinds of controls here, manipulating the appearance of fate and so on. So highlighting how important these glycans and these glycosaminoglycans expressed in extracellular vesicles produced by tumor cells are in the uptake of other cells, including in sites of metastasization, like Kupfer cells that are liver metastasization site. We saw differences in invasion of cells that were uh, recipient of extracellular vesicles, so a cell that receives the uh, that receives the extracellular vesicles from the wild type cells have a certain amount of invasion capacity. When they receive the actually the, the, this is the baseline when they receive the extracellular vesicles from a wild type uh, cell, they continue having uh, quite a high uh, efficiency. When they receive EVs from knockout uh, for Syndicam 4 uh, containing the glycosaminoglycan, they reduce dramatically the capacity to, in to invade, for example. 
And of course, in the, the proteome of the receiving cell also changes because it receives the, the content transmitted by the extracellular vesicle. Here we highlight the differences in the proteome and of course including the, the presence of syndicate 4 in the recipient cell. Moreover, when we move to in vivo assays, analyzing the, metast the metastatic niche uh, reaching, so we uh, observed that extracellular vesicles of the cell lines of the EVs from wild type cell lines, from cancer cell lines, EV, wild type, they go more to the sites of metastasization uh, like liver and lung, whereas extracellular vesicles from lacking this proteoglycan, syndicate 4, and the, and the glycosamino, and the paranosulfate uh, glycosaminoglycan uh, show a dramatic reduction in this uh, organ. And moreover, we could measure even the uptake in the distance by cell. So, for example, again, by uh, analyzing by flow cytometry the different, the different markers and different recipient cells, we again see uh, differences in, um, in the recipient cells in the in vivo setting. So, gastric cancer cells uh, drive EVs, carry heparin sulfate, proteoglycan CD44, which affects EV uptake, as I mentioned, and as I show you, and also that it dictates uh, EV organ uh, tropism uh, to the common metastatic sites in gastric cancer, which is particularly liver. We also did a, a few more studies using this uh, proteome um, uh, signature of, of the, based on the proteins that are carried by EVs containing the syndicate 4. So these proteins were particularly relevant in the in the cancer setting. And those using these uh, proteomic signatures, we can evaluate um, uh, databases uh, that allow us, again, to stratify patients um, with, uh, in terms of prognosis and, and clinical outcome. So again, providing critical information for better patient stratification. So with that, I think I can, can finish uh, highlighting uh, the importance of understanding the, these biomarkers in the context of the biological setting and in the clinical setting. Uh, but up, and this uh, information, this critical glycan information in the different levels of analytical strategies that one can use can be really important for better patient stratification, uh, not only in gastrointestinal cancer, but in many tumors, uh, as, as I highlight here. So, and with that, I think I can finish by uh, thanking uh, all the, I mean, the members of the group, but also the collaborators, many international collaborators, uh, and thanking you for your attention. And I'm open for questions.